श्री एस के निरंजन रेड्डी थैंक यू मैम मैम आई 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 फील प्रिविलेज दैट ऑन दिस मोमेंटस ओकेजन व्हेन वी आर रिवाइजिंग द एंटायर क्रिमिनल लॉ एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन आई गेट टू स्पीक ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ माय पार्टी आई एम राइजिंग टू सपोर्ट द बिल फॉर ए फ्यू रीजंस व्हिच आई विल स्पेल आउट वन आफ्टर द अदर मैडम माय फर्स्ट रीजन फॉर आर पार्टी सपोर्टिंग द बिल इज द क्लियर इंटेंट दैट द गवर्नमेंट वॉन्ट्स टू शो for the purpose of changing and improving the criminal law administrative system so when i say improve i there have been there has been some criticism that uh, the laws are mostly similar to the outgoing legislations in many areas there is also been a criticism that there is been a cut and paste job i think this criticism is misplaced i feel madam that when these all laws are being replaced some of the provisions have been interpreted over a period of time the courts have now given specific meaning to certain expressions they have called out specific procedures that need to be followed also built in certain safety so if those provisions are reincorporated when a new law is made it will settle a lot of these provisions because some new provisions dealing with new offenses are being introduced separately under the penal code there are some new procedures being brought in under the bnss and there are some new evidence act provisions which are brought in under the new act but when a lot of the provisions which are otherwise working well if they are retained in the new provisions that are made i do not agree with the criticism that this should not have been repeated there should have been a whole scale change the other criticism is that the old acts could have been amended if only the government wanted to introduce a few new provisions or a new few new offenses or new procedures now this also ma'am i do not agree completely because what would happen is if someone is making large scale changes to existing laws by the very numbering of the provisions the amendments will make the act unwieldy like in the income tax act when amendments were made amendments were made where the amendments would start with a particular section it will start with 15a it will go to 15za it will go to 15ze so if we are making certain large scale changes to the law i commend the government's approach in bringing in a new law while retaining the essence of the old law wherever there is no difficulty ma'am having said this i think the revamp of the criminal justice administration is a journey it is going to be arduous but it needs to be earnest i would want to compliment the government on starting this journey well it has not stood on a principle or ego because when this laws were introduced in the first instance madam what is redeeming for me personally is that the government agreed to refer the matter to a joint parliamentary committee which means the government was willing to look at suggestions the joint parliamentary committee made certain recommendations the government in my view accepted the correct recommendations one of the recommendations of the parliamentary committee was contrary to the supreme court judgment the government was cautious it did not accept that recommendation because it understood that the law has been interpreted in a particular manner so the provision one of the recommendations was not accepted now not only that when the bill was introduced in the other house yesterday the government made two further changes because the government received a, a a proposal from the medical practitioners that some of these provisions may affect the medical practitioners without an intention so the government is exhibiting a keenness where it wants to keep improving now that is a great position to start the revamp of a law because as i said uh, madam the journey will have to be humble it will have to be earnest it will have to be by, by people who are not standing on ego and i am very glad that this government has shown an openness and willingness for the purpose of making further changes madam i i believe that the old method of making laws has now fundamentally undergone a shift earlier society would move at a very slow pace 
So if a law was to be made, the law would hold good for 20 years, 30 years. But in the current situation where developments happen so very fast, the approach may need to be one where the government may have to come up with many iterations of the law. So if this is the first step in bringing in the law, as so long as the government is alive to any evolving developments and is making changes accordingly, then, Madam, I think we would be having a first-rate law which the government is proposing to start and it has started on a good note. Just for instance, to give an example, from the time this act was originally proposed to the bill being discussed before the Honourable Parliament, the government was not looking at a situation of a deep fake. Now, deep fake, even under the current amended law, would have to come possibly within the meaning of forgery only. There is no separate offence for deep fake. Luckily, we have a provision under the Income Tax, uh, sorry, the uh, IT Act and the rules, which make adequate provision for punishing people who are resorting to deep fakes. But the penal law, while this, in my view, would also be a penal offence, the penal offence is being addressed by virtue of the IT Act being capable of roping in such a mischief. So some of these new developments that may happen would need to be incorporated into our law from time to time. For instance, Madam, I also find that while we have taken care to bring in uh, snatching of mobile phones or movables as an offence, we would still have to go back to the IT Act for the purpose of a data theft. Someone may not steal the mobile, but someone may actually be stealing the entire data from the mobile. Now, this may possibly come within the meaning of theft, which is very broadly defined under the old IPC and also under the new uh, uh, enactment. But there is no separate offence which deals with data theft. Now, as we go forward, there may be further developments that may happen where the law may have to be amended for the purpose of incorporating this. So, ma'am, I have a suggestion for the government. In the insolvency regime, we have a permanent committee which is called the Insolvency Law Committee. The law committee constantly looks at the developments in the field, it looks at development in the courts, and it constantly keeps making recommendations to the government that if a particular provision is introduced or if a particular explanation is added, it may clarify the position. And the government has been making these changes in the insolvency and bankruptcy court from time to time. Now, that, Madam, deals with a very uh, uh, law, simple law in the relative context of the uh, criminal administrative laws that we are looking at. And in that narrow space, that law has been very throbbing and has been uh, alert to the needs of the society because of the Insolvency Law Committee being a permanent body that continues to make recommendations. So the recommendation, ma'am, I have for the Honorable Home Ministry is the Honorable Home Ministry may consider, the government may consider having a permanent committee which could be headed by people who are experts in these areas who would also get a feedback from the stakeholders from the lawyers, from the judges, from the litigants, and then see how some courts are interpreting some of these provisions, because some of the interpretations may go, go contrary to the spirit with which the law has been made. So a small addition, small alteration, a small explanation may make a huge difference. So ma Madam, this is one of my suggestions for the government, because this would make the law nimble, agile, and it will be very quick to react to whatever is needed of the society. Madam, the next point that I wish to make is a lot of new provisions that have been made were previously not covered. So the government is moving in the step of identifying some of the mischiefs which have been left out, where the government wants to arrest them, and they have incorporated a lot of things like organized crime, petty organized crime, terror has been defined. We, we have now uh, uh, an offense relating to uh, uh, endangering of unity, integrity, and sovereignty of the country after repealing the sedition laws. What I find, Madam, is that while we are making provision for dealing with offences like this, the acts possibly at this point fall a little short of defining these terms and confining the meaning of these terms. Now, what has happened, Madam, is when criminal laws 
use expressions that are very wide. The courts have held consistently, this is courts all over the world, including the Honorable Supreme Court in India, have taken a view that if the expression is not clearly defined, it may start affecting persons and citizens who are not originally intended to be captured within the provision of that mischief. This makes the law excessively broad. It may then become vague and it may therefore be struck down. So we have had one provision of the uh, IT Act, provi Act being struck down on this theory. I fear that some of these provisions are going to be challenged in court and therefore it, would may, it, it may require, as I say, a further iteration. It may require, at some point of time, the parliament to step back in and clear, give a clear definition so that these expressions are confined to the area that they are intended for. This is, again, a suggestion so that we don't wait for many years to pass and for a court to eventually define how this term must be understood. Because the, the entire area of defining what the term will mean is essentially that of the parliament and I think that is a right that we need to exercise rather than leave it to the court to interpret because of a gap in legislation. I am not at this point, Madam, suggesting that there are gaps that cannot be filled. I am only saying that the law can be improved with further iterations after hearing the stakeholders. Madam, then I move on to the next point. Another reason why we support the bill is the idea to quicken the criminal justice process system, the courts, and the, the manner in which an FIR will be lodged, a final report will be filed, the additional time that will be granted. All of this is good. The idea is noble, but it comes with a set of challenges. Madam, I would want to apprise the government that this is akin to the government wanting to have a very fast train, but the rails, the infrastructure is creaking. Madam, I appear in courts regularly when I'm not here, and I have heard judges complain, including in national company law appellate tribunals, NCLTs, commercial courts, and other regular courts, that the judges are working in most subhuman conditions because they have no assistance, they do not have a stenographer, judges are writing 80 pages to 120 pages by hand because the judgment will have to be delivered under the CPC, within 30 days after the matter is reserved. Now, we have made a provision that a judgment will need to be delivered within 45 days, but I have serious doubts whether the infrastructure would enable the coming into effect of this clear, noble intention of the government. Madam, I also have a suggestion here. The suggestion is the central government will face a difficulty because the courts are a state domain it is the states that will have to make provision for having adequate infrastructure. Center will not be able to sit on the state's head and we sitting in the council of states would not wish that the center should impose more than necessary. Now if that is so, one of the ways the central government could consider ensuring that the intent that it has to have a first rate criminal justice administration in the country is given effect to without the states falling behind on providing infrastructure possibly would be by giving by, by providing for certain incentives like the finance commission does when states meet certain targets be it in the power sector be it in the educational sector or solid waste management whichever states ensure that they are doing this the finance commission is granting a higher share to the states so if the legal reforms are also going to be included, specifically with reference to the criminal law justice infrastructure, then this act and the intent that it seeks to achieve can be easily accomplished. Otherwise, this might remain on paper. Like, Madam, we all know, the Representations of People's Act says that any election appeal in the High Court must be decided in six months. The law makes that provision, but we see that it rarely ever happens Lucky are those legislators whose cases are decided before the person who won complete system. Election petitions are now stretching for four years, four and a half years. So while we, make a pro while we may make a provision that a judgment must be delivered within 45 days, I am foreseeing some difficulties on the operational side because of the infrastructural deficiencies. So that may need to be attended to to give complete effect to this law. Madam, then. 
I have a suggestion to make with regard to the forensics, the, the provision of forensics that has been included, clause 176.3 of BNSS is a very important provision. The government has also taken a very practical view. The government notes that it may not be possible to operationalize this forensic uh, study being conducted unless an adequate infrastructure is built up. So the provision says that it will come into effect from a date to be notified by the state government within five years. Now, in this five years, the forensic infrastructure may need to come in. But one lacuna I find, and this may have to be addressed separately, not through the criminal justice system, is that the forensic science and forensic study in India does not have any regulator like the medical institutions or any other institutions. So a regulatory standard may need to be set up an accreditation, which will recognize may have to be provided. So my suggestion, Madam, would be that the government make an appropriate provision for ensuring that the forensic framework is put into place. Sir, there is one other area that the government may have to consider and the IT Ministry of the Central Government has doing a fantastic job in this. For the purpose of criminal investigation, we now enable the collection of uh, biometric data by the investigating agency and by the court. Supreme Court says this is permissible. So there is no problem about the legality of the collection of some of this data. But the issue would be, where would this data be stored? How safe would this data be with the police and with the courts? What would be, how would the issues of privacy be covered? So these are some aspects that may need to be considered once these provisions kick in and they start operating from whatever date is notified by the state government. Sir, I then move on to certain aspects because we're dealing with a set of three, three different laws. I'm, I'm just going uh, in a uh, 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 seamless manner from one act to another in relation to the criminal justice machinery. Sir, the concept of fair trial and the right of an accused. So when I say accused, I am not speaking about a person who is convicted or is guilty. I am speaking, sir, of a person who is accused of a crime and our law proceeds on the assumption that every accused will be deemed to be innocent until he is proven guilty. So a person facing a charge who is an accused starts off with this presumption in his favor. We have had a very famous saying by one Russian writer, Fyodor uh, Dostoevsky, who said, the mark of the development of a civilization is not from the way it deals with the people who have achieved well in the society. It is in the way it deals with the criminals of the society. Sir, with these two philosophies in mind, I have three quick suggestions. Sir, on the aspect of bail, I find, sir, that a majority of the old provisions have been carried over. It is salutary because the Supreme Court has interpreted these provisions to say that bail is the rule, while jail is the exception. But what happened, sir, is because our justice system was not very good, we have noticed a tendency over a period of time that courts are hesitant to grant bails in any matter where it, where it, think, it thinks the accusation is grave because Several of these matters were resulting in acquittals because of witnesses turning hostile or the evidence not being properly placed before the court. Sir, once the changes are made, once we bring in forensics, once we have a better administrative system, we should slowly now start moving towards the developed countries where the criminal justice system cl clearly adheres to the belief that a person will be released on bail once he provides adequate security and if he is not interfering with the criminal trial and his punishment will start after he is convicted by the court, not by putting him in jail and not granting him bail even before he is found to be guilty. Because, sir, in many cases we see if person is in jail for six months or one year and eventually it is found that he is actually acquitted, then the civil liberty can never be brought back. Please conclude, Niranjan Reddy. 
Sir, I, I, I have... Uh, you have nine minutes, you have spoken more. Very well, sir. I'll try to finish as quickly as I can. Sir, while the bail has been liberalized, sir, there's one area that the, uh, the government may have to consider. Sir, clause 479 in subclause 2 says that the benefit that the government wants to give of half the term being already spent in jail and one third if it is not punishable with life or death, the person is entitled to be granted bail. 479.3 says the above provision will not be applicable if the person is guilty of more than one offence or is involved in more than one case. Sir, even if a person is accused of only one offence, many times we see, sir, that in the FIR they list out four or five offences. So even a first-time offender in the first FIR registered against him will have more than one offence mentioned against his name which will deny him the benefit of the bail that is provided under 479.2 of the uh, BNSS. Sir, the third of the issues relating to the rights of accused is in relation to handcuffs, while clause 43.3 specifies that it will be done only in some uh, serious cases. The Supreme Court has clarified that this is ordinarily treated to be inhuman. It must not be resorted to except in exceptional cases. Sir, I would want the government to lay down clear guidelines. It is not that whoever is accused of that variety of offences need to be brought to the court in handcuffs. Sir, I have been in courts, in criminal courts. Sometimes when there is a, when there is a grave offence and an offender is brought before the court, it is quite scary. Sometimes it gives us confidence when we see th if that person is handcuffed, but this would be extremely rare cases where that kind of protection may need to be granted. So the government may have to come up, sir, with some guidelines in the cases where handcuffing, handcuffing will be permitted. Sir, the uh, provisions now introduce the salutary feature of community service. Just two quick points. Sir, what will qualify as a community service? The types of community service are not specified. Now, this would leave it to the discretion of the magistrate. The magistrate will decide what will be community service. Is it sweeping the road? Is it maintain, manning a public duty at a traffic light? Or is it something else? So, the legislature may have to step in. The parliament may have to come in for the purpose of indicating what are the types of community service that can be imposed by the court the discretion will be with the court to impose which of the appropriate punishments. Also, sir, if the punishment is to be community service, the Act does not make a provision as to the length for which community service needs to be imposed. So if someone is guilty of theft of less than 5,000, it cannot be that he will be asked to undergo community service for three years. That will be worse than him facing punishment for that offence which may be very small. sir. Then I have two, three other suggestions for making this even more workable. So we find that the Supreme Court of India is inundated with bail petitions, anticipatory bail petitions, and quash petitions, either grant or someone challenging the non-grant of a quash order. So this is happening because the old CRPC provided that all these bails, anticipatory bails, and quash petitions will be heard by a single judge of the High Court. There is no intra-court appeal provided under CRPC. So in the writ jurisdiction or on the civil side, there are a few appellate provisions which say that the appeal would lie from a single judge of the High Court to a division bench. So if in CRPC we bring in, in the new law, if we are able to bring a provision which will say that there will be an intra-court appeal in relation to bails and quashed petitions, almost 80 to 90 percent of the people will get their justice in the division bench, either they win or they lose. Very few cases will come up to Supreme Court. It will not clog the Supreme Court. Otherwise, Supreme Court is now left with dealing a lot of these matters, and it is not able to focus, sir, on the more serious and important issues. My friend, sir, Mr. Honorable Member Sujit Kumar had spoken about multiple FIRs. Sir, I find that we still will be having the same problem, that for one particular incident, multiple FIRs can be filed in multiple jurisdictions. We have not made a provision, sir, which says that if an FIR relating to that particular offence, I'll take only two more minutes, sir. 
if an FIR relating to the same offence is already registered, and if that is brought to the notice of the second registering police station, the police station must cease any further action. This provision is missing, sir. This may, again, as I mentioned in, in the earlier part of my address, if there are going to be repeated iterations, and that will be the way we will keep improving, some of these things can be addressed. Sir, also I notice in clause 173, when an FIR is to be registered, the uh, government wanted to ensure that the non-guilty people are not harassed. So clause 173, 3 says, that a particular police officer may take 14 days for the purpose of conducting a preliminary inquiry. But strangely, sir, that is only fixed for offences above three years and below seven years. So if it's an offence below three years, there is no provision today for conducting a preliminary inquiry. Sir, also we need to consider whether this one uh, clause 173.3 providing for preliminary inquiry should be for all such offences because it may mean that FIR is not registered for 14 days at a go. So the last of my suggestions, sir, Please conclude. clause one, yes, sir, this is the last of my submission, sir. Clause one of each of the bills, <laughs> sir, nomenclatures the act as BNS, BNSS, and BSA. Sir, I am using these abbreviations because I am not comfortable with the language. Sir, I, coming from Hyderabad, I can speak a bit of Hindi, but even I am not comfortable with this language, sir. Sir, the Constitution provides that the acts and the text of the act, which includes the name of the act in Clause 1, ought to be in English. Sir, I respect that possibly we are trying to move away from a colonial hangover and a past. We want to signal a clear sign that this is our own homebred, our own cultured law. Sir, this can be easily achieved without affecting the sanctity of the constitutional provision by saying that this will be called so-and-so, so-and-so in English and also called so-and-so, so-and-so. Okay. So the two names, if they are mentioned, sir, what may happen is, in any event, the language of the court will be the language, the language that the courts are using. The act becomes much more easier, sir. After spending so much time, sir, I can... I, I have had this request from a lot of my lawyer friends who keep requesting that when I get to speak on this bill, I must make a request to the government to please include both the English and Hindi titles for this act so that the act will be easily operational. Okay. Sir, I thank you for the opportunity. Sorry. And I, sir, I uh, uh, conclude by saying that my party entirely endorses the approach. We want to go along with the government and keep improving the bill. My suggestions are constructive. Sir, I would request the Honourable Home Minister to consider these suggestions. We support the bill fully, sir. Thank you. Sri Kartikeya Sharma.